Nate, are you a gambling man? I bet a dollar in Vegas in like 2007 and won nine bucks. And so I've never bet anywhere since. A dollar doesn't really make you a, a high roller, but I'll raise you this. I think we can have a really interesting conversation on regulation and governance. I won't take the bet because I know that we are going to have that. I will, I will bet that you are correct. Come on, throw in a few bucks. All right, okay, well, shall we roll the dice? Let's oh, do it. So bad. They all want a bit of AI. The viral popularity of generative artificial intelligence has triggered an arms race. Microsoft is betting it can revive Bing with ChatGPT. Google has barred, and the Chinese search engine Baidu has ErnieBot. Even smaller competitors are jumping in. The investment over the last six years has shot up by over $1.4 billion, and deals are skyrocketing too. There's a reason the sector is awash with cash, because they need it. AI algorithms require a lot of data, computing power, and engineering talent. That's why the latest and greatest in artificial intelligence isn't coming from academic institutions where it was born, but from the companies with the deepest pockets. The bubble has echoes of crypto. Remember crypto? Today, it's Microsoft-backed OpenAI, Google's DeepMind, and Meta's AI lab that are taking the lead. You used to find AI research at universities. Now it's moved to the big tech companies. This looks like it could switch the balance of power in a big way. While companies race to find ways to monetize their technology, it's not totally clear what oversight's going to look like. Will government keep high-flying ambitions in check? As the hype continues to grow, it raises questions about who gets a head start in building out this generation-defining technology and what that huge influence means for the rest of us using it. James, so happy to have you here. You're an investor in Silicon Valley. I Sorry, got to interrupt you briefly. Our producer's got a piece of paper for us. There it is. Full disclaimer, James is a partner at Bloomberg's early stage venture capital arm, Bloomberg Beta. He is. He does know a lot about machine learning companies though, which is why we've got him on. So as I was saying, I would love to hear what sorts of things are going around the San Francisco dinner table. What are you hearing at some of these dinner parties? I mean, I think everyone is just trying to figure out what this all means. And depending on how drunk people get, either they think this is a great chance to build some companies or the end of the world, right? And I think that's the biggest interesting thing that's going on. No one really knows what this looks like and it's changing so quickly. But there's so much money being thrown at it. So mm -hmm. someone knows what they're doing. Uh, you're an investor who's actually writing the checks. Uh, where are you seeing some of the most compelling opportunities, interesting ideas coming out of this? I mean, I think part of what's really weird about right now is that on the one hand, you have these opportunities to invest billions of dollars to build foundational models, which in some ways feel like railroad tracks, right? That the bet or the dream is that we'll be able to build something that lasts for not just a few years, but is durable for decades, if not centuries, and will create this incredible value because everyone will be relying on it forever. And part of what's interesting about right now is that that's not clear, right? It isn't clear that that's gonna be something that actually lasts. And so that's one of the sort of big questions everyone has right now. And then the other thing that's going on is that anyone could build an application. You know, we're now at a point where you could take this laptop and you can start programming or asking ChatGPT to build an application for you. And it will, and it'll do a pretty good job. So there's this sort of opportunity to like try lots of different things and no one's really sure what's gonna work yet. But do you see it as being kind of like the early days in the web in terms of like the potential experimentation? Because in the early days of the web, I mean, the web came out of academia essentially in research. It wasn't coming out of multi-billion dollar corporations. And the, imp like the reason that they were creating that was just to make something that was useful. That's not strictly all we're seeing now with AI, right? We're seeing things that are, they have to be opportunities and they take billions of dollars to even see if it's gonna be an opportunity. Like, right. it, is it comparable to, to the web in that sense? In this way it is. The people who, are built, who built the web and the people who are building these very large models are fundamentally driven by ideals. There are a whole set of people who basically made a bet on their life, not to make lots of money, but to create something that is really close to artificial general intelligence. And they're 
fundamentally driven by that ideal. And in that way, we have a very similar dynamic. One of the criticisms I think that we've seen come out of the high flying valuations of you know, the pandemic, even a little bit post pandemic, um, has been that VCs kind of drove a lot of that by giving these startups that maybe didn't deserve it, mm -hmm. um, you know, the valuations that then pressured in some ways the business to go in on all growth, you know, at all costs. How do you see that playing out in AI? Do you see the VC community pairing that that excitement to place a really high valuation in some of these companies back a little bit? I mean, valuations are a fiction, right? I mean, ultimately, valuations are based on like part how much someone's willing to pay, right? So the highest bidder on the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, sort of the investment that I make as a VC is very, very different than buying a public stock in the sense that my downside is a little more protected, right? And so that changes the math a little bit on the one hand. But I'd say that if you were to look at a lot of these very big investments, you're right that the VCs are expecting to make money, right? And they're expecting to see at least hints of progress or traction in the relative near term. And what's different between this and let's say the consumer web, the free version of the consumer web, is that it looks like there's willingness to pay, right? That corporations, individuals, small teams, when they see something that works, it's sort of eye-opening and they're willing to pay money for it, which is, very different than, let's say, you know, that initial wave of consumer web companies. What what did investors learn? These same let's let's take these the same mm -hmm. hypothetical VCs. Like, what did they learn from the the crypto boom and bust? Ouch! Like, because that was that was nasty. A burn. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Like, what what's the takeaway? And is this the next? I don't want to say bubble. Uh huh. But let's say bubble. Like, is this the next bubble? I mean, I think the dynamics though are a little bit different. I have to admit that I was not as close to the crypto run up and run down. But just as I watched my friends or colleagues who are interested in it, I think that that was always based on sort of an economic ideal. There's a technical underpinning and something sort of like just sort of like this economic dream of how currency should work or how crypto might actually make a difference there. And what's different about now is like you can play with it now and you can see the benefits now and, and in some ways it's a very different dynamic right rather than being an economic dream that drives the use cases in this case it's actual usage that we get to play with and i think that's very different than the crypto world now that said there are going to be lots of bad investments and there's going to be lots of companies that don't work out now is there going to be enough investment and enough progress in ai in order to sort of make it justified my guess is yes but We'll see in five years. Well, what's the value in failure in this context to you? Like failing in in most circumstances is often a very good thing. Like what does successful failure look like then hmm. in this sense? Hmm. I mean, I think like it's two things. So there's like this technical underpinning, right? Which is all these guys and gals hopefully are working in more public than they usually are. And so they're able to trade notes about what techniques work in order to advance the state of the art. And also in terms of like what it means to be safe and for AI to be aligned, right? And so on the one hand, they're getting a little more secretive, but they're still actually quite open. So you're able to see and talk and trade notes. So that's on the one hand. And on the commercial side, part of what's happening right now is like, you know, when you do any commercial transaction, everyone sees it and you're able to see, oh, what are the kinds of value propositions and ways of charging for things that are actually working. And then the sooner we converge on, you know, what are those lessons, the faster we're going to be able to build interesting businesses. Do you feel a sense of responsibility in that way? Because it is the VCs that are writing these checks and kind of are at the inception stages of these tools making it into the mainstream. How do you think about your responsibility? So I think, I think a lot about the people that we invest in, right? And I think that that question, because in some ways as an investor, I'm participating in the dream of the founder, but the founder is the one who's actually creating the thing. And the question I do ask myself all the time is, so, you know, if this person was the next Mark Zuckerberg, would I be proud of myself for having backed them? And I think that that's a totally fair question. Congressman Beyer, thanks so much for joining us. You're a representative from Virginia, and you recently went back to school to get your degree in computer science. Why would you ever do that? Well, Jackie, I, I'd wanted to do it for a long time. In fact, three or four years ago, I tried to do it uh, online through Coursera with Stanford, but uh, pretty quickly I found out that the math was over my head, that I, I'd never taken 
things like linear algebra and discrete mathematics. Uh, so I had an opportunity about 15 months ago to sign up at our local state university, George Mason University, uh, to begin to take the courses. And I'm on my fourth course right now. I have another three to go, and then uh, I can launch heavily into all the graduate work. So you're pretty unique, though, going back to school to learn about something that is going to have huge implications in our lives. But how are your colleagues in Congress thinking about AI? It's a big question, but if you had to boil it down on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being a computer scientist, where would you say your colleagues in Congress fall on that spectrum of their understanding of AI right now. And you are on television. I'll just put this out there. <laughs> Throw them under the bus. <laughs> I, I would bet they're somewhere near the top of the bell-shaped curve. There's a handful. There's a California named Jay Obergolte who actually has a master's from Caltech in, in, in uh, artificial intelligence. And we have a couple of PhD chemists and physicists. They're very on top of it. But the rest, I think, just mirror the American public. But I do think they feel a special responsibility. You know, it's, it's unusual. That special responsibility has just come in the last couple of months with the explosion of ChatGPT and Bing and, and all the attention that the large language models are getting. Uh, but the, the real possibilities, I think, are going to be in the application for science and for biology in particular. Well, how are you thinking about where do you start to regulate this? And we, um, we think about uh, regulation as something that stifles innovation, maybe that doesn't apply to a thing like AI. I'm curious how you're thinking about the first steps of kind of reining some of this in, or do you think that some of these companies should continue to charge forward with making some of these advancements? I think it's tough for us to wisely, judiciously get ahead of regulating something like artificial intelligence when we really don't have any idea what the downsides are. At this point, I'm all for everybody charging ahead, being as creative and, and as innovative as possible, and then recognize that when bad things show up, unintended consequences, we need to be ready to react quickly and not wait 10 years as we did, say, with social media. But let's not forget as well that Facebook charged forwards. And thinking back a few years ago to when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was giving testimony in, in Congress, like some of the questions he was being asked, I mean, somebody did ask, I think, how do you make money when no one's paying you for the products? And he had to remind them that, you know, we, we show ads. It wasn't a good look. No, I mean, how do you no, avoid- it, it wasn't a good look. And I'm hoping that we in Congress can be much more sophisticated, much more educated as we approach AI's quick evolution than we certainly were when it came to social media. Uh, one of the best ideas I've heard so far is that we you know, make sure that there's a lot of transparency, that there's self-regulation to the extent possible, and that when the uses are bad, when they're pernicious, when they're harmful, that that's what we regulate rather than you know, the basic code, the, the, the wonderful math, the, the computers, the people that are trying to do really good things with it. We've spoken to a lot of uh, really interesting experts in the field on both sides of the sort of pro-AI, anti-AI, or, or just people who are raising flags. And I'm curious how much attention you pay to people, um, theoretically, people like Blake Lemoyne or, or someone in his position. He's the former Google engineer that raised the alarm on a machine being sentient. Yeah, and he lost his job over that. And we, and we were talking with him on, on the show. Do you pay attention to people specifically like those sorts of views, but where, where it's quite a niche case? Um, or do you have to take a step back and actually sort of almost get someone to summarize a, a, the collection of, of views and, and make decisions based on that? No, I, I, well, but both are true. But I try to read every one of them, if I possibly can, and try to look deeply into it. And one of the things we did on the Hill a number of years ago was to form a little artificial intelligence caucus, which had relatively few people in it. And there was a lot of you know, conversation about the singularity. When the rise of the large language models, uh, ChatGPT, GPT-4, Bing, et, et, et cetera, um, all of a sudden we have 40 people right now, we'll probably have 100 by the summer. And I think that they're gonna be looking much more s intensely at um, what the dangers could be. Uh, I, I'm not persuaded on the singularity fears, although those seem to be the most existential out there. Um, and I guess we should be humble about it too, because, because we don't know. And because things are moving so quickly, we need to be much more quickly reactive than we have been before.
So what are you not hearing people talk about that you kind of think that they should be talking about more when it comes to the next step in, in AI's development? You know, it seems like most conversations right now are around the large language models. What does it do to education? What's it do to writing a paper? What's it do to writing a speech? Um, you know, will, will journal, television journalists be secure? Um, I'd rather that people are focusing a lot more on how we use artificial intelligence to solve the problems in the world that we actually see here today. Uh, let me give you a totally weird example. I watched a YouTube the other night on the war in Eastern Congo, uh, M23, over their mineral rights. I don't know how, but it would be great to have some brilliant young person say, how do we use AI to settle that conflict, to make sure that everybody gets their fair share of the mineral rights, that the land is secure, that we can develop a governance structure that works? I know that sounds you know, very kumbaya, um, but it seems a lot more relevant than figuring out um, are, are people going to be able to cheat on their term paper? Britton Heller, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You're an attorney and an expert at the intersection of human rights, technology, and law. Is that right? Which makes you actually the perfect person to ask a very important question that I've been thinking about for a little while okay. in terms of like recreating people digitally or their personalities digitally. You know, simple thoughts. Really simple over breakfast kind of thoughts. If I wanted to create a digital, like a new Jackie, you know, for when, when we're done with the show and there's like this gaping hole in our lives and we want to recreate each other and everyone, like what are the legal like and ethical ramifications of that? Like does Jackie need to give her permission to be recreated? Like what are you seeing? How are you seeing that unfold? That is a really good question. I've seen a separation between digital resurrections or digital reconstructions and people making art. So I think if you were going to say that digital Jackie was authentic Jackie, you would want to make sure to, to really specify inputs to, to make her that way. Will it be her conversations? Will it be her text chats. My jokes. Yeah. Will it be her body of journalism? Will you interview people who knew her? Will you replicate her voice and her gestures? When you're talking about these issues, it brings up questions about authenticity and really fundamental questions about who we are and what makes us who we are. And I like to think it's, it's more than our physical image. But that leads to other implications about the sanctity of our thoughts and our communications and what, what do we own? Well, this is a good, um, that's a good point because defining something that we don't have words for is so hard. Technology, and as we get into conversations about consciousness and sentience, we don't have the vocabulary to describe some of these things, maybe hallucinations with, you know, for example, Sydney, uh, the chat bot that kind of went off the rails. That's one way to look at it, but some people would say it's hallucinating, and then some would say, you know, this is full on sentience. When you think about this in a legal framework and in, in, in bringing this to court, how do you start to build the vocabulary around it? Um, you know, how does this look like in the courtroom? Right now, there's very few applications of AI in courtrooms because initial experiments went terribly, terribly wrong. An example of uh, kind of a, a misfire was something called Compass. And Compass is Correctional Officer Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. Snappy. Snappy. <laughs> Compass was a tool designed to help judges with sentencing guideline recommendations. In the US legal system, sentencing guidelines are just that. They're discretionary. So the judge is allowed to apply them or not apply them as they will. This was an AI-based algorithm that said, we will be able to help you, the judge, predict whether or not a specific offender is likely to recommit a crime. So it was an algorithm to try to define recidivism. The only problem with that is it was using historical data as its data set. And what this meant is uh, black defendants were almost twice as likely to be misclassified as having a higher risk of reoffending at 45% than their white counterparts at 23%. Past, past criminality does not indicate future criminality 
because we all have choices. So an algorithm like that really undermines people's free will and relies on the biases that we, that we impose upon one another in social relationships, but in a way that really impacts somebody's life, liberty, or property interests. What's your view on looking at, let's say, historic cases of where copyright, as just purely as one example, hasn't necessarily been followed um, or has been directly abused? Let's take the original Napster file sharing system. It comes up quite a lot. Like, there's no way that the music industry would ever have allowed something like Napster to exist, which is why they got it shut down and why Metallica started suing people. But the fact is, is that had that not have happened, we would not have the music industry we have today. We would not have Spotify and Apple Music and so on and so forth. Is there an element of the development of technology where you kind of have to say, well, we know what the law is, but we kind of have to break it a little bit just to get things to the next level. I think we are already at that point with AI because there are very few labeled data sets that are available to train AIs. And oftentimes when, when AI is created, even the people who make it can't anticipate how the machine is going to suss out and parse the data. An example of that is there was an AI created to help translate. And they said, OK, so go from English to Spanish to French to Japanese. Simple stuff. Simple stuff, right? And everyone thought it would go from language one to two to three to four. What actually happened is that the computer went from language one to its own made up language that it then translated into the final language. And it could not explain how that final or how that intermediate step worked. And, and that's called the black box problem. So let's talk about that because we think about the rights that we should afford a human. Do you ever see a point where we start thinking about what we owe to machines and those AI models? Would an AI model come to you and say, hey, my rights were violated, or is that still too far off? I think that's still a little too far off, but you just gave me the goosebumps. <laughs> I, I joke that I'm the lawyer of the Black Mirror, so I, I, it would not be an unusual work day. <laughs> well, hey, more clients, right? Yeah. AI or otherwise. But there are some industries that are being more disrupted. And, and as a human rights l legal expert, how do you think about the role of humans in the AI world that apparently we're all going to have now? I think AI never fully replaces human discretion. So when you have a job that depends on the gray area, which is outside of pattern identification and recognition, that's where humans can't be replaced yet. You can, like that algorithm, look at, at statistics and probabilities, but that doesn't really encompass individual choice and free will. And that's, that volition is what makes us human. So I guess we both won that bet. It was a pretty interesting conversation. It was. I mean, I knew it was going to be, which is why I didn't bet you. It really, really was. Uh, You're a cheapskate. You didn't put any money on the table. I, well, I'm the, I'm the judge. Case closed. It was interesting. <laughs>